Just one. Let's see if this thing works. George, just so you know you're alive. Yeah, I'm alive. <laughs> you are live being broadcast at the moment. Wow. <laughs> Anyway, yes. his final talk, which is, as you see, puzzles in the Old Testament, can psychiatry help? Yes. So, without well, further ado. Okay. Thank you very much, all of you, for coming uh, on a Sunday afternoon to this very obscure stuff. <laughs> um, so, <coughs> I'm not sure how this thing works, but... Um, uh, I may, may have to do it on here. Do, do you know how it works? It's another puzzle, it's not that one. Yeah, there's another puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I'll, I'll try it on here. Yeah. Which one do you press on there? That one, isn't it? There we are. Oh, okay. There. Okay, I'll do it here. Okay, now. Um, I can sit there and do that. Okay, tonight. yes. Okay, you can, it's just that end one. Watch the. Okay, well, to, today's talk is um, the last one because I've covered the major. Uh, I've covered the major characters in the Bible that have psychiatric disorder. There weren't that many. There's just Ezekiel with schizophrenia, Jeremiah with panic attacks, uh, and Job with depression. They were the big ones. Um, and Saul, who was manic, depressive, and mad. Uh, but there are lots of odds and ends all over the place, and minor characters who show a few symptoms um, and a little bit of psychiatric disorder. And there's really a lot of that stuff. And I've selected four pieces for today. Um, uh, one is Hannah and her infertility and loss of voice. The second one is the Sota ritual. The third one is the madness of Nebuchadnezzar II. And the final one is the stubborn and rebellious son. Uh, and they're all quite difficult. And they've been difficult for rabbis and people to try and explain what's going on over many centuries. Okay. This one the end? No, it's the one at the end. That one. Oh. Right, right. The, the, the bottom one, the corner one. Oh, right, I'm there. Oh, I've gone back. No. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's the third time. I've so, Hannah, um, it's a case of infertility and depression in the Old Testament. Now, there are other women who uh, were infertile in the Bible. Um, it was a disaster for a woman to be infertile in, in ancient times. Probably is today as well. It's a cause of much unhappiness. Ah, by and large, the psychological reaction of women who were infertile was not recorded. It was just recorded. They couldn't have children. The line couldn't continue. Their husbands divorced them or whatever. So the first one is Sarah. And her only emotional reaction that's recorded is that she laughed when God told her she was going to have a child at 90. <laughs> okay. She actually <laughs> cried. <laughs> uh, and um, she... Um, also um, banished Haggai. Unfortunately, half the slide isn't showing. Yeah, I, I'll do that. Scroll it. Scroll it up at the side. Yeah. Oh, no? Oh, dear. Well, um, if you want to do Joe, we're very grateful. Oh, Joe's Not that 
No, no, it, it doesn't matter. Go, go back. Anyway, I'll just tell you there's another mother who's important. That's the mother of Samson. And she's only called the wife of Manoah. We don't know anything about her, except she's the wife of Manoah, and she can't have children. Um, but then what happens is the angel of the Lord visits her, and they meet in a field, and lo and behold, she carries a child. Manoah didn't object to this, but who knows what happened. Um, now, Hannah, can we go back? Back a bit. Back, back a bit more. Okay, next, next slide. Now the actual text in the Bible is as follows. The Lord had closed her womb, that's infertility. Her rival used to provoke her se severely to irritate her. Now Elkanah had two wives. Hannah was one and Penina was the other, and Penina could have children, and she did have children. So there was a lot, of, a lot of tension in that household, as you can imagine. Um, so Penina used to provoke Hannah, because actually Elkanah uh, favoured Hannah, he liked Hannah. He says that. But she was infertile. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. So she's got weeping and anorexia. Uh, her husband said to her, why do you, Hannah, why do you eat? Why don't you eat? So he observes she's pretty miserable and he's puzzled by it. Um, why is your heart so, ha so sad? Am I not more to you than 10 sons? Um, they went to Shiloh and Hannah presented herself before the Lord. Eli the priest was sitting on the seat, he was there, uh, and Hannah was deeply distressed, and she prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. Bitter weeping means there's just a bit more than just crying, you're angry over the world and so on. Okay? Now, uh, oh God, um, the rest of that seems to be missing. Uh, she prays to remember her and not forget her servant, but I will give you a male child and I will set him before you as a Nazarite. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli the priest observes her mouth. Uh, Eli sees the lips and mouth. Hannah was praying silently. There were lip movements but no sound. Now this is a, a condition we sometimes see and it's called aphonia. People sort of go like that. It's not very common. It used to be common, um, but it's rare now. Um, Eli doesn't know what this is, and he thinks this is drunkenness. So he says, how long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, no, my lord, I'm a woman deeply troubled. So I've got a lot of anxiety. Uh, I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. So she's desperately praying. She's got a lot of worries and anxiety. Okay? So what, Hannah's got quite a lot of symptoms. She's got, which Eli, well, the important thing is, Eli records them and he notices them. So she's got weeping, bitterness, misery, sadness, irritability, loss of appetite, general distress, vexation and anxiety. After her prayer, it all gets better. Her appetite returns and she's no longer sad. This all points to a depression or something which lifts following a prayer to God. It's a mixture of anxiety to depression. Eli cannot make any sense of the curious loss of voice. The loss of voice is partial, only occurring in prayer. Perhaps it's just a silent prayer, and she's just mouthing the words. But the high priest, Eli, is unable to find any other explanation, so he accuses her of drunkenness. But Hannah says, no, it's not drunkenness. Okay? Now, aphonia, this is about aphonia. It's a hysterical conversion symptom, 
commonly associated with depression, which was neither known nor recognized at the time. We now call this an, a conversion symptom. A conversion symptom denotes the expression of psychological distress in some sort of physical form. All right, it's quite common people can have um, a weak arm or a apparent stroke and it un underlying it is some personal problem. In Hannah's case, it's partial, only occurs in one setting and not another. Okay. Oh. Now, uh, half of it's missing, I don't know. Oh dear. Um, can I just. Yes, I'll have a go, I'm sorry. Don't want to fiddle with it and mess everything up completely. Uh -huh. Anybody know how to do it? <laughs> I've got to somehow get rid of all. It's, it's in, have you got the slideshow? No, I haven't. I should get it onto slideshow, I think. Because then you should see it down the side. Yeah. No. So you want to go, go back and see where we are? That's symptoms, we've done that. And do the slide uh, view. What about view? Over there. What about view? There. View. Slide shows there. Right, right. let's go. Uh, there, there, there. there. That's better. No, we have we have That's it. Just a minute. So you want to be? Oh. Hang on. But we did that bit, didn't we? There. Go, go. Okay. Now see what happens when we go on. How does it? Oh dear. Um, which is the view where you can see the? The whole slide. So, Jason, which is the view where you see the slides at the back the side and you? Take you don't do it. Take you don't do PowerPoint. So we've done that. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll just have to say what's at the top. This is about aphonia today. Um, um, there's not many papers on it, but this is an Indian study, and they examined 700 people who presented. 700 people who presented to their A&E department with a hysterical conversion syndrome and 3% had aphonia. Ah, there it is. So they reported on 25 cases of aphonia. In most cases, it was a um, psychiatric emergency. The people rushed to the hospital because they felt very desperate. Mostly it was young women, mean age 21, and the underlying cause in these cases was exam stress, failure in examination, or family quarrels. Urban residents predicted a hospital presentation, but rural residents led to seeking help from a traditional healer. That's what Hannah does, she goes to a traditional healer. Psychiatric COVID morbidity was present in 80% of the cases, most commonly mixed depression and anxiety. In other words, Hannah has mixed, she's got mixed depression and anxiety list of symptoms which I produced. She goes as an emergency to, to the healing centre, which is the shrine at Shiloh. Um, and um, that's what probably happened. Okay, next one. Just we lost the very top. Now, this is about infertility and depression. Uh, one study showed that 39% of the people attending an infertility clinic had depression. So we know that it's a common cause of depression. On the other hand, being childless uh, is not a cause of depression. So if you look at people who have a past history of infertility, they've given up, but they have no children, they are not more depressed than the general population. So the depression associated with infertility is something to do with trying to conceive, 
the act of trying to conceive. Do you follow that? So what's happening with Hannah? Next slide. So Hannah was under stress because she was uh, continually trying to produce a baby but failing. So in the Indian study, it was exam stress that did it. So a social stress which has pressure on you seems to be behind the aphonia. The priest also uncovers the story of um, a stressful family situation. There are two wives, one of them's having a go, one of them can have children, is having a go at Hannah, and so on. So he's quite a good chap, really. Right, next one. So the conclusion is Eli was a clever chap and he thinks a bit like a social worker or a psychiatrist. One must admire this Old Testament writer. It's probably Ely, but we don't know who it was. Um, it could be an anonymous writer, but it's somebody who saw Hannah. And he accurately, he reports on the aphonia. He doesn't understand it, but at least he records it. He picks up on a lot of anxiety and depression. He can't make a diagnosis of depression because nobody knows about depression at that time. But he also elicits the underlying medical and social causes. She's infertile and there's a horrible family situation and so on. And he puts all that into the story. So he could have written it up as a psychiatric case history. But there weren't any psychiatric journals at the time. <laughs> the only journal there was, was a religious one. So he wrote it up as a religious parable. And the point of the story from religion is if you pray to God, he'll give you deliverance, he'll cure your infertility, and so on. Um, he would do well if he was a psychiatric trainee today. <laughs> so that, that's Hannah. Now we'll do the, the Sota. Now this is more difficult and um, a bit more, in a way, nasty. And this is in Numbers, it's about jealousy. Numbers 5. If any man's wife goes astray and is unfaithful to him, if the woman, if a man has had intercourse with her, but it is hidden from her husband so that she is undetected, though she has defied herself, and there is no witness, uh, against her since she was not caught in the act. So if it's secret and unknown, so, okay. If a spirit of jealousy comes on him, and if he is jealous of his wife who has defied herself, or if a spirit of jealousy comes on him, and he is jealous of his wife, though she has not defiled herself, then his wife shall bring, if the man shall bring the wife to the priest. Can I just ask two things? One, the Sota ritual, what is that? We're coming, to, we're coming to it in a minute. Oh, right. yeah. okay. so Sounds like the bloke's got a problem. Yes, <laughs> yes. So here, um, these writers say, well, even if the wife hasn't done anything and the husband is suspicious, then you must still bring the wife to the priest. Now, that's strange. Why, why punish somebody who hasn't done anything? Well, it, it, it seems to be. In the First World War, wasn't it? In the First World War, if there was a spread of BD, it wasn't the, it wasn't the, the soldiers who were responsible, it was the women that they slept with. So oh. they so attached to Well, no, but they had no blame attached to them, whereas the women did. Now, more, more recent translations of the Bible use the word suspicion instead of spirit of je jealousy. So just move on. Um, the Moffat Bible, if he has a suspicion, suspecting his wife, even though she may not have defiled, if he's jealous or suspects, that's one of them, or if a spirit of suspicion comes over him. So in these later translations, they're trying to say it's actually just the suspiciousness of the husband, which is the problem. 
So let's move on. Now, there's not many studies of this. Um, I found one paper, one recent paper. There's a whole volume on the Talmud devoted to it, but it's not devoted to the jealousy aspect. It's devoted to the ritual, which we'll come to in a minute. So Brichto, who's an American um, Jewish scholar, writes, the author seems to have known what he was doing. He gave way to a stylistic charade of pomp and ceremony in which the tragic figure of the accused wife seems to hold centre stage, while the cognoscenti in the audience have fixed their attention on the clownish figure of the insanely jealous husband hovering in the wings. So he says it, this is about jealous husbands. So next slide. Now, an insanely jealous husband is akin to the modern concept of morbid jealousy, which is a condition that we see in the clinic. The textbooks describe this as a delusional disorder. The central theme is the person's delusion that his or her spouse or lover is unfaithful. This belief is arrived at without due cause and based on incorrect inferences, supported by small bits of evidence, e.g. disarray, clothing, spots on sheets, which are collected and used to justify the delusion. The individual with the delusion usually confronts the spouse or lover and attempts to intervene in the imagined infidelity, e.g. by restricting the spouse's autonomy, secretly following the spouse, investigating the imagined lover, or attacking the spouse. Pro probably some of you may have read of cases like this in the paper. Have you? Yes. yes. So let's go on to the next slide. It's to do with control as well. It's to do with control, yes part of it, but the delusional one is not about control. But the, okay, next slide. And clinical practice today is very important, this thing. It, it's not a, not a minor matter at all. Um, as in the Bible, jealousy today can be based on real unfaithfulness, but often is based on suspicion alone. Two groups are important in clinical practice. One is psychopathic men with controlling behaviours, as you said, and secondly, those with uh, delusional de jealousy, as described above. Now, I used to see one or two cases a year of delusional jealousy when I was uh, working in Bromley as a psychiatrist. So it occurs in Bromley. <laughs> um, and it's impossible to deal with. You can't argue with these people. Um, the only treatment is separation. You actually have to tell the other partner, you have to get divorced, you've got to move away, and so on. Because it's a very dangerous condition. Um, in the UK today, two women are killed every day, uh, every week. Um, and jealousy of one sort or another does play a part in these. Um, for the psychotic ones, they often do actually kill their spouse, the ones with delusions. The others, the controlling psychopathic men, will beat their wives up and cause a lot of domestic violence, and that's very common. So it is a problem. What, what do you do about it? So what happened in ancient Israel? They were also worried about it. What did they do about it? They seem to have recognised that it was a serious matter and even if the suspicions were false, you couldn't just dismiss it. You had to do something to calm the man down. That is, if you leave the situation alone, there's a risk of spousal murder. Now this is the law in cases of jealousy when a wife, while under her husband's authority, goes astray and defiles herself or when a spirit of jealousy comes on a man and he is jealous of his wife, then he shall bring the war woman before the Lord and the priest will apply the entire law to her. The man shall be free from iniquity, but the woman shall bear her iniquity. Now, superficially, this seems very unfair. Um, 
but in fact it works to the woman's advantage. The problem is, today, and I presume in biblical times, you actually can't confront an enraged, jealous man and say, look, let's think about it and talk about it. It's quite, they're dangerous people at that point. On the other hand, going to a priest as a mediator and so on might help. And the priest then does an actual ritual called the Sota, and this is what it is. The priest shall take holy water in an earthen wet vessel and take some dust that is on the floor of the tabernacle and put it in the water. The priest shall set the woman before the Lord and dishevel the woman's hair. So there's a humiliation here. And place in her hands the grain offering of remembrance, which is the grain offering of jealousy. Let the priest make the woman take the oath of the curse and say to the woman, the Lord make you an execration and an oath among you, your people, when the Lord makes your uterus drop, your womb discharge. Now may this water that the curse enter your bowels, make your womb discharge and your uterus drop. And the woman shall say, Amen, Amen. So this is pretty horrible, okay? This is a, the um, priest dishevels the hair, which is upsetting, and then if the woman is guilty, her uterus drops out, which is really horrible. Uh, no, it's not a miscarriage. It's, we'll come to what it is in a minute, okay? This, this is in the Torah, by the way. It's not um, innocent stuff. Are you going to mention anything that happens to the... If there is another person involved, another guy involved, does anything happen to it, it doesn't talk about that. Curiously, um, adultery was punishable by death. Um, and in the Middle East today, in Iran, it still is punishable by death. Stoning. Pun Stoning. But in the Old Testament, there's no case of a woman being stoned to death in the Israelite literature. So I think they were much more tolerant uh, of, of such behaviours, okay? Because after all, people did go and have a second husband or a second wife and so on. So people were having affairs. But anyway, when the priest has made her drink the water, called the water of bitterness, then if she has defied herself and has been unfaithful to her husband, the water that brings the curse shall enter into her and cause bitter pain, and her womb shall discharge, her uterus shall drop, and the woman shall be a, an execration among her people. But if the woman has not defiled herself and is clean, she will be immune and be able to conceive children. So there's a curse of infertility as well as the uterus dropping. Now the Talmud has a whole volume devoted to this particular ritual, and it gives reasons for every single item in the ritual, but it doesn't deal with the fundamental problem of the man's jealousy. So how can we understand the rationale of this strange ritual? And this is a puzzle, and perhaps psychiatry can help, and medicine can help a little bit. Most commentators accept the womb falling out of the, the vagina is something which we call prolapse womb today. This is a uterine prolapse. It's a common condition in gynaecology. The condition was known in biblical times because it's described in the Egyptian medical literature. It's mentioned in the Cahun Papyrus, about 1800 BC, and also on the Ebers Papyrus, 1500 BC. And that's long before the Book of Numbers. So. Egypt is near Israel, and actually Israelite culture is largely dependent on Egypt, so they would have known about it. But what sense can we make of it? In order to understand what it meant at that time, we have to look at studies of prolapse of the womb in underdeveloped countries where there was no treatment, because there's if we look at the UK today, there's treatment for prolapse of the womb. So what goes on in the UK today is not relevant. But what goes on in 
um, poor countries with no medical services is relevant. So this study by Walker and Gunasekra, they pulled 30 studies and found 19% of women have prolapse. Peak prevalence is age 45. The symptoms are urinary incontinence, some coughing and standing, and that was just present in 28% of cases, but 6.9% also had fecal incontinence. Now that is unpleasant. Additional symptoms, uncomfortable feelings of the vagina, back pain, poor sleep, low energy and impairment of sexual function. So it, it's not a very nice thing to have. A Nepalese study identified risk factors, including extensive physical work during pregnancy, as well as after delivery, multiple, multiparity, that's loss of births, and unskilled birth attendance. Now, all those conditions would have been present in ancient Israel, all right? Nobody knows about how to birth somebody. The women are expected to work throughout pregnancy and go out into the fields two days after they've delivered, and so on. And they also had loads of children. They also measured quality of life, and it had disastrous effects on marriage and family relationships. And the more severe it was, um, the more damage it caused. And in particular, there was shame, understandably associated with the symptoms of urinary and fecal incontinence. All right. Now, Brichto, who writes this article, he said the social is really strange. It must come from the mind of one person. You follow that? It's not a group thing like perhaps the Ten Commandments, which is quite a lot of people getting together and saying, you know, these are the things we must do. It's not a Talmudic debate. He thinks it's just one person. And he says it's really bizarre. You can't find it anywhere else in religious literature of any religion, or you can't find it anywhere else in the world, literature. So how did this chap think? Women who have their wombs hanging out of their vagina are very distressed and they are experiencing a medical emergency. So they will rush to see their nearest healer. Uh, I've written that twice, okay? But they will rush to the priest, okay? There's no doctors, there's only priests if you're in trouble, okay? But it must have looked awful to this priest. Uh, and he would have thought, this is terrible, but he would be puzzled by its cause. The only available explanation for medical conditions at the time was that sin caused sickness. Or all illness was punishment from God because you'd sinned. There was no other explanation. Occasionally the Bible just says, so and so, the Lord took him away. Um, which means he died of natural causes. But by and large, if you had some chronic disability or something, it was because you'd sinned. And certainly a religious man like the priest would have thought in that way. So this must be some punishment from God. So what have these women done wrong? Now, prolapse occurs as a result of perineal damage, as a result of childbirth. So all the people who presented with prolapse would have previously born children, and therefore they would have been married. Of all the sins that married women commit, this priest must have thought infidelity is the most heinous. Religious leaders don't like infidelity. That goes for Christian leaders, Muslim leaders. Not so much for Jewish people, but um, infidelity is pretty much of a bad thing. So he thought these women must have been unfaithful for their wombs to drop out. But at the same time, he was seeing enraged, jealous men accusing their wives of being unfaithful. Local gossip in his parish would have told him, yes, everybody's having affairs with each other. It's all like Sodom and Gomorrah and so on. So, it's, so then he would have thought, 
it must be true. Everybody is having affairs. And these men are probably correct when they say their wives are being unfaithful. And that explained the many prolapse wounds that he also saw in his work. Do you follow? What you have to try and solve is why these two medical conditions are joined together. That is prolapse womb and morbid jealousy. They don't have any logical connection. But in the mind of a religious priest in the ancient world, they seem to. So then he wrote this down, presumably, and then other people read it and took it up. Next. Now, the direction of the Sota ritual in the Book of Numbers is suspicion of infidelity, report wife to the priest, drink bitter water, wound drops out if you're guilty. Okay? That's the way it's written. Okay? But it makes much more sense if you reverse the order. Woman presents with a prolapse womb, terrible punishment from God, she must have sinned, worst possible sin is infidelity, suspicious men are often correct, need to devise a test of guilt, hence the Soto ritual. Okay? And this is the only way in which I think you can link these two mysterious illnesses um, together. No, it. that's right, that's, that's, that's right. A, that's a bit of mumbo jumbo. That's mumbo jumbo. And hopefully, you know, the wife, nothing would happen unless she's had that's that right. problem. Unless she's already so she's, got so she's innocent, yes. And yes. She's already heading that way because of all the children and everything. That's right. So it's very strange. It's strange, yes. It's a bit like the, uh, the witch thing, isn't it? Oh, witch, witch, I'm not. Oh, well, if you... If you yes, sing yes, and drown, yes. then you're not a witch. And if you float, you are a witch. You can't yeah. Yeah. Now, at first glance, the Sota appears to be misogynistic and degrading of women. But it probably acted in their favour by offering some protection from their insane, deluded husbands. Thus, the jealous husband complains to the priest who takes his suspicion seriously. He humiliates the woman in front of her hus husband by dishevelling her hair and asks her to drink some bitter water. And this serves to reassure the jealous spouse that someone important is taking his suspicions, delusions seriously. This of itself would diminish the severity and associated anger of such delusions and so decrease the risk of marital violence and spousal murder. I'm not sure I follow that. Pardon? I'm not sure I follow that. Uh, it does make matters worse. No, the, 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 the risk in the situation is that the man will go on and either kill his wife or beat her up and do something horrible, because we know that happens. And what seems to emerge is the ancient Israelites knew that was a risk. Otherwise, they wouldn't have bothered with all this stuff. So actually, I think the other, the other thing is it's true, that if she's already got prolapse uterus, and if it's made worse because she believes that as well, then he's likely to beat her up. I don't know if it says anything what to do afterwards. But if she isn't, doesn't have a prolapse uterus, then he might, because of all the mumbo-jumbo, he might actually believe that she's innocent. Yes. yes. Anyway, nobody ever... Uh, there's no recorded case of her womb dropping out because as Barbara points out, if you drink some funny water with a bit of tabernacle or dust, uh, it's not going to do anything. No, it's just that she, if she's got prolapse. If she's got prolapse already, yes. So when it came to the woman drinking the bitter water, this never caused you to write prolapse, so no cases are recorded in the Bible or anywhere else. We shouldn't be surprised because uterine prolapse is the result of difficult childbirth and, mul and multiparity, not drinking <laughs> funny water. So it probably worked as a way of mollifying angry, jealous husbands in early biblical times. 
And the last bit is, by the time of the Second Temple, the practice was abolished by Rabbi jo Johanan ben Sakai. Okay? So this is a very obscure bit of uh, numbers, um, and I've never had a satisfactory explanation. This is my explanation of it. Makes sense because there's no evidence that would actually convince a jealous husband that his wife was innocent. That's right. Except going to a higher authority. That's right. And having a higher authority assuage his, his fears. That's yes. all you could do. That's but right. But you say that there's nothing really you can do with these people. That's right. They're very difficult. Very difficult. So this is a very early account of how you deal with morbid jealousy. It's strange, but um, it, it does show how they think. Right, now the next one is changing into a wolf. <laughs> and this is the story of Daniel 4 about ne Nebuchadnezzar II's insanity. Again, it's a bit different. So what do we read in the book of Daniel? Nebuchadnezzar, 605 to 562, has a frightening dream, but he cannot understand it. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was living at ease in my home and prospering in my place. I saw a dream that frightened me. My fantasies in bed and visions in my head terrified me. I continued looking in the visions of my head, and as I lay in my bed, then a holy watcher came down from heaven. He cried out aloud and said, Cut down the tree and its branches. Nebuchadnezzar could not understand the dream, nor could his ba Babylonian dream inter interpreters explain it. But the Jewish ex exile Daniel is called in to explain the mysterious dream. Daniel explains to the king that this dream has the symbolic meaning that the soon the king will lose his empire, everything being cut down, and he would eventually go mad. So what actually happened to Nebuchadnezzar, according to the book of Daniel? All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of his royal palace. And the king said, is not this the most magnificent palace in Babylon, which I have built at the royal capital of my mighty power and my, maj my glorious majesty? Um, the Bible's quite keen to punish those who've got pride, so it, it does this to David and um, Saul and all sorts of people, but uh, it's doing it to Nebuchadnezzar here. While the words were still in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared the kingdom has departed from you. You shall be driven away from human society and your dwelling shall be with the animals in the field, and you shall be made to eat grass like oxen. And seven times have passed over you, you will learn that the Most High has sovereignty over the kingdom of mortals, and gives it to whom you will. Immediately the sentence was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from human society, he ate grass like oxen, and his body was bathed in, in, in the heavens until his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers and his nails became like bird's claws. When that period was over, I, Nebuchadnezzar, had my eyes to heaven and my reason was restored to me. So that's what happened. That's a strange story, isn't it? Was it true? The biblical account of Nebuchadnezzar, the, the seven, uh, where it says passed over seven times, that's generally interpreted to mean seven years. So the biblical account of Nebuchadnezzar's seven year descent into madness is now not thought to be true. Seven years, seven times passed over probably refers to a seven year, year period. Now the Babylonian literature on uh, their kings and about Nebuchadnezzar II is detailed and he has a 43 year reign and he's very busy fighting all sorts of people. 
there's no seven year gap and there's no record of him changing into some kind of animal, no record of him being deluded or anything. So it's difficult to believe that. But there was a later monarch called Nabonides who was strange and did go off and live in the desert and he went away for 10 years. Um, and this was Nabonides and he's actually, uh, he, when he went to the desert he appointed Balshurazor as his regent and this is King Bel Belshazzar in the book of Daniel. Nabonides was the fourth successor to Nebuchadnezzar, the last king of Babylon. And there's a chronicle of Nabonides in the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's about a paragraph about him, about how he became ill. He had inflammation and he went to this place, Tima, in the desert. So, so it probably refers to this king Nabonides, who's fourth, six after um, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Now, what, what is lycanthropy? It's a rare condition, and it refers to a delusion of belief that one has become an animal. Um, I, I've seen one case in my t 30 years in Bromley, so it's rare, all right? But it's just a strange delusion that people go around barking or mooing like a cow or whatever. Um, it probably has its origins in folk tales about changing into animals. Several animal transformations, different ones are described, but the most common one is changing into a dog or a wolf. Changes into a cow are known as boanthropy, but there are reports of people believing they've become bees or frogs or whatever. Zoanthropy uh, is a mixture of animals, such as a cow and a wolf. And that's what um, seems to have happened to Nebuchadnezzar, because he goes to the field and eats grass like a cow, but he gets claws like a wolf. But the text is fairly clear that it's not a real transformation, but it's a disorder of the mind, as it, it says, let his mind be changed from that of a human, and let the mind of an animal be given to him. In other words, he has the belief that he's um, an animal, and that's delusional. So a little bit is known about it. There were epidemics of this lycanthropy in the Middle Ages. 30,000 cases reported in France during the French Inquisition. This epidemic hysteria, this mass hysteria, um, and people would say, uh, if you tread in a wolf's footpath, you'll get this disease, or you touch water. That you'll be bitten by a wolf. You'll be bitten by a wolf. Yes, uh, and then, like, like sort of hysterical girls in a school, they all faint together. And that's how it is. That's an epidemic hysteria, uh, which is. Not, not common now, but we do see it sometimes. Would, would that be also a way of getting out of the most horrific situation? Yes, yes, it would. would. And, it, and maybe they just leave you alone or, or feed you. Yes, it may have been a way of escaping from the Inquisition. A recent study by Blom, he found a total of uh, 50 cases, or 56 cases, and all the cases had a psychiatric diagnosis of something quite severe. Schizophrenia, psychotic depression, bipolar disorder, and other psychoses. And when it comes to treatment, only a third got better. Um, and that's with standard modern treatments. But death rates were high at 13%. Now that's because um, much of the, his cases were from before 1920. There were old cases. Today, you would get something better. So it's a strange delusion. It occurs. Um, now, what about lycanthropy in Babylonia today? 
So two Iraqi psychiatrists wrote a very fascinating paper entitled Lycanthropy in Babylon, the existence of an archetype. The authors revisited the southern Iraqi province of Babylonia where Nebuchadnezzar II is alleged to have had his act lycanthropy. They went through the medical records, the psychiatric records of two hospitals in Babylonia. And Babylonia is a biblical place, but it's also a province of modern Iraq. Okay? And over a 20-year period, they found eight cases of this delusion, in indicating that the condition described in Daniel 4 still flourishes in Babylon. It's still around. And they found that uh, all their cases had had terrible losses and life-threatening events before, okay? And they got better. Another case that these people cite is Avicenna's case. Avicenna was a Arab physician who was interested in psychiatry. And he described a case of boanthropy, which is a man believing he's a cow. The patient came to be a cow, bellowed like one, and in an attempt to cure him, Avicenna describes an early attempt at what is known as procoleptic therapy, which is confrontational therapy, where you confront somebody and say it's not true, it's nonsense. And what he did was he bound the patient's hand, hands and feet, then told the patient that a butcher was going to come and slaughter him. Avicenna then left the room and later returned, dressed in a butcher's outfit, and proclaimed to the cow that he was too lean to slaughter and he had to be fattened up. He then untied the patient, who promptly fled, began to eat enthusiastic, gain strength, and got rid of his delusion, completely curing him. It's a bit like, it's a bit, it's a bit mortified the mess, isn't it? Pardon? Or nursing. Yes. I mean, it's amusing, I mean, whether it's true or not, we don't know. So who actually had the lycanthropy of the Bible? Nebonidas suffered from inflammation, so he didn't have the... What, what is that interpreted as? What would you say? In, in I, I don't know, it's just written as inflammation in the text. literature now from the middle of 2016, I think, or just coming up to that, that inflammation is the cause of a lot of psychiatric... Yes, yes. The time's recent. Yes, it, I, I, I don't... It, it, it may be true, or may, may not be, but... Uh, anyway, anyway, it's not going to empty psychiatric hospital. No, no. Um, now, Nebuchadnezzar was too busy to have any sort of mental illness. <laughs> So it, it must have been some other person, it might have been the Bonides, but it was some other person who suffered from the delusion, but who was familiar to the writers of Daniel 4. Again, we don't know who these people were. But what they did was probably an act of li literary vengeance. They placed this illness onto Nebuchadnezzar the second, Nebuchadnezzar the second who'd been a cruel and hated torturer of the Jews. We all know about Nebuchadnezzar, he was a horrible man, and deported everybody from Jerusalem to Babylon, and so on. And to add insult to injury, they changed his Ill illness from simple inflammation to one of insanity. Um, and they gave him one of the most degrading delusions that they could think of, which was lycanthropy. Perhaps that's speculation. Um, but what, all we can infer from the story is, is that this rare and strange delusion of lycanthropy seems to have been known at that time in the ancient world. The biblical writers chose to give it to Nebuchadnezzar uh, to get their point across about how, if you are really horrible, persecutor of the Jews, you're going to get your comeuppance. Um, just a couple of things which you can keep thinking out so that I don't say it, but one is uh, that something like history as written by the victors, 
Yes, so, yes, it is. It is. And the other one is that you say they've been raised by all three blue hair and long nails, but that's, I think, it's No, I think it's history written by the victors. I mean, the, the biblical text is written by Jews, for Jews, and so we're, we're the goodies and everybody else is a baddie sort of thing. Um, but within that, once you take that as read, you can find things about the ancient world which are of interest, generally. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar probably lived a hundred years before uh, Daniel. Um, because uh, he, he lived, um, he, he was at the time of the deportation, and then Daniel is in the Persian period of the Jews, which comes after 539. Um, so it, it may not have been Nebuchadnezzar, but it doesn't matter, but they put it on him. Pardon? It's used in all kinds of literature and stories, hasn't it? Yes. Yeah, like J.K. Rowling. Yes. One guy yeah. who keeps turning into a wolf. And yes. Them. But uh, I don't think it has the connotations of these. Yes. Yeah. So again, that's a mysterious passage in the Bible. What does it mean? And what's its significance? Okay. Now the last one we're going to do um, is the stubborn and rebellious son. Now this is in Deuteronomy. Uh, the book of Deut Deuteronomy chapter 1 has several laws on respect for life and these include what to do about the stubborn and rebellious son and this is 2118 if someone has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey father and mother who does not heed them when they discipline him then his father and mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of the town at the gate of that place. They shall say to the elders of the town, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the town shall stone him to death. So you shall purge the evil from your midst and all Israel will be afraid. So that's not much fun really, that's not very nice. Drastic, <laughs> isn't it? That's in the Torah, okay. Um, now, in the early patriarchal period of ancient Israel and also in ancient Rome, parents had the absolute right to execute their children. It's not doesn't seem to happen very often, and doesn't happen in the Old Testament. But Tige points out that the under this Deuteronomic ruling, such an execution could only follow a trial and on the authority of the elders. And the killing was conducted by all the men of the town, and not the parents. Oh, yes. <laughs> it, meant, it gave a ruling whereby the parents could share the killing of their own unmanageable son with the rest of the community. Curiously, the punishment of the insubordinate son in ancient Mesopotamia, as recorded in the Code of Hammurabi, Kirko, about 1800 BC, was less severe, all you could do was cut, cut off their hands. <laughs> they can't do anything. Yeah. Anyway, so it was a problem in the, in the ancient world what to do about delinquent children. So let's move on. All oh, right. Now, it, it was pretty horrible. So the rabbis of the Talmud um, didn't like this and they did their best to say it didn't occur and it seemed grossly out of tune with the Torah's laws on family but it, this is what the priests who wrote Deuteronomy placed in their text so we must respect that but later on the rabbis of the Talmud from the 4th to 8th century produced a lengthy discussion in Sanhedrin to show that someone, that such an event never occurred because there was no one who qualified 
as a stubborn and rebellious son. So let's see what they said. First, the Mishnah states, a stubborn and rebellious son, when did he when does he become liable to the penalty of a stubborn and rebellious son? From the time he produces two hairs until he grows a beard right round, by which is meant the hairs of the genitals, not of the face. But the sages spoke in polite terms. <laughs> so this is a referral to pubic hair just beginning to grow. Secondly, the son means not a full-grown man, whilst a minor is exempt since he does not fall within the scope of the commandment. This means not a minor, nor a full-grown adult. Third, if he ate tartima, some unknown food, in company celebrating a religious act, Rabbi Abahu then commented, he is not liable if he eats it in a company consisting entirely of good-for-nothings. Good Fourthly, there is an, em an exemption clause based on the phrase, he is a glutton and a drunkard. Rabbi Hanan B. Molodek said, he's not liable unless he drinks and he buys meat and wine cheaply and consumes them, for it is written, he is a zolel, a glutton. Fifthly, Rabbi Hanan B. Molodek said, He's not liable unless he eats raw meat and drinks undiluted wine. And by this is meant, meat, meant insufficiently diluted wine. And raw meat means only partially cooked meat, like the ca character of meat, charred meat, cooked by thieves. Sixthly, <coughs> Rabbi and Rabbi Joseph both said, if he eats pickled meats or drinks wine from the vat, i.e. new wine before it has matured, he does not become a stubborn and rebellious son. Finally, who, the passage concludes, with whom does the following Bereta agree? There has never been a stubborn and rebellious son. So why was the law written that you may study it and receive an award? Yeah. So if I go to that steak place and uh, pick an injunction. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, if I have it medium but not rare and not well done, I'm okay. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> okay. So, You're too old to be a stubborn and rebellious <laughs> son. So this is, I mean, I've actually abbreviated this bit of the Talmud. It's about 10 or 15 pages. Um, but nevertheless, you can see they're trying to preserve a more compassionate impression of the Torah, and they argue away, away the very existence of the stubborn and rebellious son. So such punishments were never administered. He turns up in the to some extent. He does, yes. Yeah. Yes. So who was right? The cruel priests of Deuteronomy or the compassionate rabbis of the Talmud? Well, there's evidence that the stubborn and rebellious son still exists. Um, society has no answer for the drunken, violent adolescent, but we should at least be thankful that we have secure adolescent provision for such dangerous youths. A study from one such unit reveals the scale of the problem. Hill report on 37 admissions to an adolescent secure forensic unit. These clients were responsible for 2,388 violent incidents over 6,000 admission days, suggesting at least weekly episodes. Of these incidents, 761 incidents comprised of physical assaults, 8.4% were patient on patient, but 91% were patient on staff. Now, in ancient Israel, there were no specialized units, it would have been the parents who are at the receiving end of these violent attacks. So what could they do? So th the underlying psychopathology of these clients is learning difficulties, conduct disorder, child abuse, domestic violence in their families, but not psychotic disorders. There are psychotic disorders in adolescence, 
but it, that wasn't the problem. Many of these children in modern studies also had learning difficulties and were incapable of changing their ways. So perhaps that is the meaning of stubborn in this phrase. A follow-up study showed that um, a third of them developed substance abuse, which usually means drinking. In ancient Israel, the substance abuse would have been alcohol, and that's why um, they're called uh, they're called drunkards. Okay. So such children today presenting with repeated assaultive behaviours are uncommon. They're removed from their parents, cared for on a compulsory detention order in institutions. And so it's little wonder that in the ancient world they were sometimes killed. Actually, I only learnt about this group of people after I retired and I had a job um, reviewing mental health detentions. And I had to go all over Kent and I visited some of these units and I couldn't believe some of the stories of these recurrently violent uh, adolescents. So I think the priests of the Torah were probably right and the rabbis of the Talmud probably got it wrong. The passage in Deuteronomy legitimised such a killing by making it a judicial execution and is con conducted by the whole community, enabling the guilt of the parents to be shared with the rest of the community. Now the priests of the Torah, Torah lived amongst the people um, and the people brought their problems to the priests who basically had a pastoral role. They were doctor, social worker, religious advisor, etc. So they saw a much bigger variety of human suffering than the rabbis of the Talmud. The rabbis of the Talmud lived in ivory towers in the great academies of Sura and Pumbedita. Like the academics of today, they spent most of their days debating with each other and they didn't mix with the common man. Thank you very much. Most societies, most societies had very stringent rules about the young because they were afraid of them, because they were, they were always liable to be erratic. And they, there were all sorts of tribal things they found in South America and other places we went, where the elders held the young in control. Yes. Mm. Right? Yes. So it's, it's a very common problem. It's everywhere. Oh, yes. Yeah. Now that's why it's mentioned in, in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy. It's a real, it's a real problem. It's a real problem. Things that I remember at college when they had the initiation, they don't do it in Britain, I don't think, but in America, uh, in universities, they have these initiations for the young men getting into various um, uh, clubs and, yes. and so on, fraternities. But even that is a way of controlling. Yes. The behaviour of, of young yes. teenagers. I mean, now we see a crisis of knife crime on the street. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Um, I've, I've just come back and recently come back from Thailand where I was working with English and Thai people. And it's, it's the Thais have um, a, a, a culture which respects adults and respect parents and respect older people much more than we do here so that when mm -hmm. if if somebody was like that although we say when you're initially saying that well it's like teenagers isn't it actually in ancient societies i'm, I'm sure it would be more like currently in thailand where yes. your parents were respected you respected them whatever I think, that, I think you're wrong. I think you're wrong. I think you're wrong. I think the, the, the reason is in those societies, from the time the children are born, they're brought up to believe in the, in the strength and wisdom and authority of the elders. In our society, they're not. Well, increasingly, I'm increasingly, that's exactly what I'm saying. It, no, but they're conditioned. The, yes, what, but what, that's what, what goes on in those societies is a very rigid conditioning of the young. Yeah. We've lost it. 
Well, but the, the, this problem refers to rare children who are recurrently seriously violent and attack their parents. Um, and I think that's what was going on in the Torah, and that's what we see in these specialised units today. Yep. Do women never get out of control? Yes, they do, yes. <laughs> they do. Speaking of having two daughters. Yeah. Yes. Well, I suppose you just married them off to somebody who would beat them up. <laughs> well, I haven't noticed it, actually. <laughs> no, but they, they do. They have a... Yeah, they have a... Yeah, they have a... Yeah, they have a... A young man cursing God. Yeah. And they put him to death in the end. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which, which portion was it? It was Leviticus. And it was about a young man. It was a bit more complicated than that. Because yes. he was married. But he was cursing God. Oh, right. And he was put to death. And in the end... Um, the, the story goes through, and uh, so he was put to death. Serves him right. <laughs> <laughs> we can expect that from you. <laughs> There's the voice of a progressive. <laughs> he didn't say it. No, he didn't. No. <laughs> so yes. So uh, and there was no record of that ever happening either, was there? They were destroyed by the Home Office. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. Yes, I'm wondering, with the increasing number of murders in the last year in London, acid attacks, knifings, and everything going wrong under the sun, what has actually triggered it? Oh, is there one... One incident or, or one one government new regulation or perhaps cutting back on welfare I, I think or housing that's so complex. Yeah. Cutting back on education, it, cutting it, out youth school youth clubs. Is there one thing you think that might have started it? There's there's no one thing, but there's many things uh, I think that family life particularly in, among some of the ethnic minorities has deteriorated and the government cuts have probably contributed to that but the, the youths are growing up in these communities very um, deprived and their childhood violence hasn't been contained so they reach adolescence when they can get weapons in a aggressive state and so on there are many many causes um, actually Martin has a point there was a suggestion in the last several years that um, violent crime, at least in the Western world, including here, was to some extent um, generally decreasing. There are some crimes because of yes. technology that are impossible to commit. You don't hear about bank robberies anymore. There were suggestions that there was less lead in the air, which didn't, which didn't fire up the adrenaline and testosterone that goes yes. into the hand with young men. And now, suddenly, this year, um, yes, sadly, you're seeing we're getting all these pointless knife attacks. As for the acid attacks, that has been going on, sorry to say, I think that's been occurring in Jamaica for some time and uh, that's just uh, made its way into Britain. Mm. That's possibly true, yeah. yeah. I mean, on one of the television programmes, I think, what's your emergency? There was a, a, a mother ringing up saying her son was beating her up and beating the house up and throwing everything around. Yeah. And when you actually saw him, he was an angelic looking 14 year old. <laughs> really? <laughs> Well, but obviously, it's such a disturbed household. No father, bigger. Yeah. No, yeah. You know. mm -hmm. so it's all, all the reason yeah. I mentioned it, we think we're having a hard time at the moment, but look at the thousands of immigrants who would love to come to this country because we've got subsidised housing, yeah. mm -hmm. free education, free health, well, uh, and a lot of other things. Mm. Which Martin, I think we're yeah. straying yeah. down into different <laughs> realms here. Uh, we didn't uh, come for yes. a political psychiatry, not politics. Yeah. 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 No, but <laughs> politics affects everything. Well, I know. Yes. Uh, <laughs> oh, I can drive you wild. <laughs> One of the things you said which interested yes. me yeah. was that the rabbis well, of the Torah well, well, yes. were right about yes. severe punishment for anyone who stepped out of line. Yes. And you thought that the rabbis of the Talmud were not right, but they were talking about something different. No. I think the Talmud rabbis yes. were actually limiting the space in which yes. a young man is at his most dangerous. 
Yes. And sort of older or younger, it's the late teens and early twenties yes. who yeah. are the real problem. Yes. Which we know is. Um, they're beyond their parents' control because they're almost adults. Yes. They're capable of being independent. Yes. They also think they know everything. Yes. At that stage. A lot of people know that. So, um, I think part of the problem is the size of the population. We don't. Have at one time, you had a proportion of policemen to the number of youngsters. Yes. Now, because of political stresses, financial strains, or whatever, Democratic. you've got not enough adult policemen mm. and far too many teenagers. And I think until we get a bit more <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's going to stay on as it is. Teenagers. I mean, okay, <laughs> teenagers start when? That's the other thing, isn't yes. it? Because a baby will, a child will say, I hate you, I wish you were dead. Yes. Mm. But they don't mean it. No. But when they see it, it's empty time they do and they it. And they see how easy it is, maybe yeah. they just slip over the edge. But we've got all these structures. We've got police, prisons, specialist units. So we can cope reasonably with it. But in ancient Israel, there was nothing. You've got so these... Big work for, for what I mean, it's like he was living amongst the people. How big would, would it be very, very tiny, wouldn't it? The, the group community. that he would, the community that he'd be living among. I mean, I can remember going in to see paintings of uh, European cities in 17 something, which is obviously a mm. long, long time ago, and they were minute. You yes. look at them now and think they're a village, so it must have been. Everybody must have known everybody else. Yes. So you yes. would know if somebody was really totally out of order and behaving yes. out of out of the norm of of the, the society, yes. wouldn't you? And I, I think each priest would have a, a small community, yeah. perhaps a hundred, two hundred yeah. people. Yeah. Uh, like rabbis. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I need <laughs> Okay. okay. Can I just say thank you very, very much again, George, for not just this one, but all five of them. And I'm sure you're going to find something else to do. Okay. <laughs> we look forward to hearing okay. from you. And again, Susanna, thank you so much for all this lovely food. Yes, yes. Thank, you. thank you very much for coming and listening to me. It's obscure stuff.